Okay, uh, I'm Aesthetics. Okay, this is Johnny Christmas, guy I met up in uh, New York City at the Hope Conference at the Triple H party. Uh, this talk is basically, it's called Kraken Encrypted Intelligence. Um, it's basically a look at pattern analysis that I've just found from uh, just patterns which emerge in human behavior, which go into both cryptography, uh, cryptologic study, and artificial intelligence. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's, um, that's been found. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, let's see, this is my fourth year at Freaknik. And uh, I spoke last year on like uh, history of artificial intelligence. So uh, that's up on my website, aesthetics.net, if you're interested in it. And let's see. What? Oh, that'll be cool. OK. Yeah. And um, with Ilanka Dunn, I co-founded the Midwest 2600 organization. There's Represent. some cards up here. Yeah. <laughs> and a couple of kids. We've got like, bootleg shirts running around $10. If you're interested, please help, because we can't afford this otherwise. Um, okay. well, right, it, it'll help we us get home. need to get home. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, essentially, this is sort of a pun on words. It's like It doesn't really make much sense right now. And uh, I absolutely love the Information Awareness Office logo because of the Illuminatus uh, eye in the pyramid, which has a whole lot of lore and weird cultic, occultic studies. Um, Hold it closer. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, the whole notion of crafting, cracking encrypted intelligence is going with the notion of cryptography and viewing artificial intelligence almost as cryptography, like trying to crack, say, the human genome or trying to crack um, just uh, understanding how the mind works, uh, which uh, these patterns that uh, I'll probably go over just. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's get into it. Okay, cool. Click it. Okay, what the hell is this talk supposed to be about? Uh, I went over this a little bit already. Basically, um, if you examine the history of cryptology, uh, going back, David Kahn's The Code Breakers is an excellent, excellent research resource for this, although um, anybody here attempted to read it, it's like this thousand page mammoth tome. Basically what the guy did, um, this is in, I wanna say the, it was published in 1967, so this would have been the mid 60s. Um, there was a lot of really interesting uh, research going on uh, through World War II, and he became interested in cryptology, so he start, there, there wasn't any one definitive resource for it. So he started driving all over the country, meeting up with different individuals. Um, I want to say William Friedman. I don't know if he met with him, but, um, and, and going to different museums and different places that a lot of crypto research had taken place at, and he started uh, and picking things out of newspapers, and he started to compile this massive fucking tome, which is like, it puts you to sleep trying to read it but it is like rich, rich in detail. It's incredible. Very well um, worth the read. Right. Have you read it? Um, I've gotten into it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's really say, hard not, reading. I've not finished it. Right. Um, but it goes into, it covers a really, a, a lot of really cool stuff. And if, if you analyze uh, like where substitution ciphers come from and the derivative going into polyalphabetic ciphers, thus into the Enigma code. And for this talk, I'm stopping there. I'm not going to go to modern cryptology because that gets way too in depth. Uh, there's just a lot of interesting ways that you can just watch the uh, development of um, it making and breaking codes. And on the same note with cryptology, or not with cryptology, with artificial intelligence, a lot of, like, the, the foundational research for that was the Turing test, and it actually predates, it goes back to Descartes, and it goes back a, little, a lot further back to Greek mythology. But um, artificial intelligence kind of takes off at the same time the modern computer takes off. Um, and th basically, the point of this talk is going through, analyzing, seeing these patterns and where these advances in crypto and AI come from, and then subsequently using these patterns that we've discovered, and our NLP expert, Johnny Christmas, is going to show how you can use these to basically manipulate your environment and workplace. Um, next. Okay. Why well, choose AI, uh, AI and cryptology? I covered this a little bit. They have a lot of interesting, uh, a, a lot of correlation between the two. Um, cryptology is, uh, the, the way I like to put it, crypto, it, it all d also depends on how you define AI. Cryptology is um, taking these patterns that we recognize exist and trying to break them and trying to make them I indecipherable to, like, you know, say you have person A send a message to person B, and you have person C, I the Alice and Bob complex, if anyone familiar with crypto, anyone here, please? <laughs> You've got one guy and one oh, guy in the on. back now. Okay. 
So, see, this is what I need the, the, I could be drawing this out right now. Okay, so you have Alice trying to send something to Bob, and... Can, ever, can everyone see this? Okay, uh, just imagine okay. Alice here trying to send something to Bob, and you have, you know, Craig down here, or what, whoever you want to call him, trying to get the message. And the idea is that you can take your plain text and apply whatever algorithm, be it, you know, ROT13, be it Caesar cipher, be it transposition, and, cr and make it so that it is indis that the person who is trying to intercept it cannot read it, but the person who is intended to get it is able to, intercept, is able to understand it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll start going into some crypto history. This goes back to, uh, let's see, Julius Caesar. The Caesar cipher is named after him, where he had, um, like, if you take your typical alphabet, uh, it, it's best, I like to view letters as symbols because you have different types of alphabets. You have uh, the Latin, French alphabets. You also have Greek alphabets. You have Aramaic, Hebrew, um, different Asiatic alphabets. And if you view, uh, rather than letters as symbols, it becomes much easier to make these uh, distinguishments. Um, basic substitution ciphers, which is base, wh one of the first areas that uh, crypto developed in. It dates back to uh, the Arab culture. Uh, you had guys like uh, Kalkashandi, who I read about in here. Kalkashandi and several others who started to analyze these patterns and uh, introduced the notion of using multiple alphabets to cover up what you're doing and make it so that other people who are trying to read it cannot, which is this essence of cryptology. And subsequently, as they analyze different alphabets, frequencies begin to emerge. And I, I could be drawing this, but I can't. Um, in like the English language, because in our date and time, English is universal. Um, different pa patterns will emerge as far as frequency. You have E is the most common character used 13% of the time. Uh, T, A, I, O, and N follow, which is like 12%, 11%, and 10% each, respectively. And the longer the plain text, uh, the longer the cipher text that you have, you can analyze this and you just pick out, out of all these letters, you know, E occurs this many times. And the, the longer it is, the more precise it gets. And if you have just a simple substitution cipher where A is equal to 1, B is equal to 2, et cetera, or it, other variants thereof. Or like what we have up here on right, the screen. Right, exactly. The, uh, I'm sure you've all seen a cipher disk at some point in time. Um, Captain Crunch used to include one in their cereal boxes back right. in the day. That's how common Captain these are. Captain Crunch, Dick Tracy did it. it yeah, you know. these were the old ones. I mean, all the way back even through the 50s, you get your decoder rings or whatever, and this is how they work. It's like one of the most basic forms of uh, encryption. Pretty much you'd have the smaller disk inside the larger de decoder wheel, and you'd turn whatever letter you were looking up, and then you would see what letter it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And you would do each letter, write it on in your paper. Now you've right. decrypted the code. Real easy to crack. As I said before, you can crack it with frequency analysis, and um, it, it, it was a very basic cipher. However, most people are stupid, especially in the dark ages when a lot of this was going on, uh, when black chambers developed, when uh, different kings and popes had um, organizations that were founded explicitly to crack these codes, and uh, they would, you, you get a cipher, a really common, ex a really, really good example of this is the Mary Queen of Scots case where um, you had, what's her name, the Queen of England, Elizabeth of England, was, uh, there is all this controversy about whether she was the rightful heir to the throne. And Mary Queen of Scots, many people said um, she should be. Now, th there was, she was a Protestant versus Catholicism. There are a lot of uh, differences going on. So Mary Queen of Scots was trying, she, she was locked in prison. And Babington was a man who, was trying to carry out messages for her, and they were using a specific cipher. And the queen's uh, cryptanalysts, cryptanalysts broke her cipher, and it, and subsequently she was confined to prison and beheaded for it, uh, because they were able to uncover proof of a treasonal plot. One of the many downsides to having a poor encryption key be exactly. beheaded. Right, and, and you can even look at a substitution cipher as having a key of a single letter, a single number. For example, if you're doing a Caesar cipher where it's rotated three times, the key could be seen as C. So you have A becomes C, B becomes D, et cetera, it rotates. And the notion of ROT13, rotating letters 13 times over, dual ROT13, which is a fucking joke. 
and, and so on. And from substitution ciphers eventually emerged polyalphabetic ciphers, which it basically means multiple alphabets. Uh, what that is, instead of where in a substitution cipher, you have uh, just a single rotation or each character is replaced by um, another, a single character from another alphabet, you actually have two complete alphabets that are rotating. Um, if you set this up, if you take the little disk and put it inside of the big disk, as he was saying before, you can see one-to-one -one correlation. This symbol equals that. However, do -do -do. Thank you, to, thanks to Blaise de Visionier and actually Giovanni uh, Battista Porta, who developed <laughs> the Visionier Tableau. You suck. And there is an example here where uh, you have these alphabets, and it, it's rotated. And you, for every letter, there is a completely different alphabet. So uh, say you, you have plain text E, and you want to encrypt it with F. So you find E here, and then you encrypt it with F, find the alphabet for it, and you get G, or J. And I think that was a little confusing. Was it? OK. Let's see here. This is what I need a fucking marker for. This is really hard for me to do verbally. What, what's the end result of what you're trying to the show? The end here? result is that, OK, you have one letter, you encipher it with this, and that's good. And then it rotates to the next alphabet. And so you say so, so you're trying to encode the words fun. Okay, you, you encode the word F with whatever and you get that. And then you get the letter U and you have a completely different alphabet that you encode it with another letter. And it makes it exponentially more secure. Just decoding, just go backwards. What? Well again you still have to have somebody who has the the alphabet that you are currently using. Which letters to encode it with? Oh, you have a key. Uh, it, it's a sa instead of having a single letter key like you do with the substitution, you have uh, multiple letters key. Say uh, you want to use a three or a five. The, the longer the key is, the more strong it will be. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. Right. And actually, well, not ready for that, but whatever. Um, and it. This is what I need this for because this stuff is really hard to explain. Polyalphabetic ciphers were known for many, many years as le chiffre de cipher, uh, undecipherable cipher, uh, just because they were so difficult to break. And it wasn't until Charles Babbage, the same man who developed the difference engine number two and whose accomplice, Etta Lovelace, founded computer science, um, devised this method uh, that you could crack it. It's if you, sh I really, really need this. <laughs> Damn it. That's poor preparation. What? That's poor preparation, man. What? This is dry erase. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Well, say you have a cipher text, and you have well, the idea is different repetitions will occur. Um, so you have K I U, and then it's later repeated again K I U. You take the place where the first repetition is, or well, you take the second repetition and say it's in place 253, character 253, and you subtract from that the first area of the repetition and, like, say 18, and you get this number of the difference between the two pla the, the difference between where the repetitions are, the length between which they occur, and you're going to get some number, say nine, and if you have nine, you look at what nine can factor into. Nine can factor into one, three, and nine. Nine times one, and three times three. And does this make sense so far? It's really complex. <laughs> I <laughs> know. wish you had that board now. Yeah, so <laughs> just grab the Sharpie, man. Nobody else is using that board anyway. Who had that marker? Right. Yeah, but nobody else is going to use it. It was for Cory Don's presentation, so I don't think anyone Somebody's going to get a marker? Please. Well, maybe we can get back to it then. We okay. just push on. <laughs> okay. Well, essentially, if you have mo you, you calculate all these different differences between where the repetitions are, and your these factor the numbers of the factors will emerge a pattern. And say you have one, three, nine, the next and the next few you, you have other numbers that it factors into. And eventually, you're going to start to see a trend. Maybe they're all three. 
And what you do is you simply break the ciphertext up into um, groups of three or how many that is, and it turns into, you run a frequency analysis on each column. And th this probably makes absolutely no sense. I've written a paper up here. I call it Never Whistle While You're Pissing. Um, it's very and, true. Anyone who has ever read Illuminatus Trilogy should get that, another obscure book. And it makes a lot more sense in here than what I'm trying to portray right now, given no dry erase board. And Charles Babbage managed to crack this. And what he showed is that even though they tried to apply another layer, another exponential um, obfuscation onto the cipher, still that same pattern emerged, however, in a different layer, the same pattern still emerged. And it's the inescapable patterns that we have in human nature and language. Yeah, I think, okay. I think what you're getting at is that no matter how far you try and encrypt your encryption over and over again, as long as a human, human intelligence is still uh, creating that encryption key, you will still be able to de determine the, right. the frequency that occurs within human intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, as anyone as a programmer knows, there is no true random number. Um, mm -hmm. And even if you think of a random number, there's some reason you thought of that random number. And if you're creating an entire encryption key based on random numbers or characters or something, there's going to be some form of repetition just based on your own uh, your own internal logic. Oh, I'm going to get into that. One time pads, um, that, the, that comes into the World War II stuff. Where I was about to make the break over to Enigma. And the way that Enigma works, um, well, Bletchley Park is where a lot of the, al where the allies and Alan Turin did the research when the German Enigma code and um, came out there were several different variants of the Enigma cipher. The and German Enigma code being right. the cipher that uh, the Germans used during uh, the World War right. II. And, and they cracked messages. it at Bletchley Park. I actually was able to visit Bletchley Park in England, um, I want to say in March. I was I did a semester over in England, and some of the most amazing stuff I've ever seen. It's also where Turin built the first modern computer, too. Or, whoops, I hit the wrong key. Okay. Uh, this is... Huh? Sweet! Okay. Yes! Does anybody want to go back over the... Poly this is about to get far more exciting. Okay. Does anyone want to go back over the polyalphabetic cipher, how to crack that? I, th okay. I think you really should. Right. That's why okay. we're here. <laughs> it's two colors, man. Okay. We can't even handle that. Okay. So we have O K I U V V K I U X whatever. And we're not even going to get into why you right. chose those letters. Right. Uh, there are very important reasons for choosing each of these letters. But uh, within this, uh, okay, call this a ciphertext. We have KIU here and we have KIU here. And it, it, it's simply a repetition which occurs within the cipher. This is placement two. This is three, four, five, six, seven. Place seven. Seven minus five. And, well, that doesn't work too well for, because five is a prime number. And that's equivalent to 1 times 5. And if we have another repetition, say V, and say there's another V over here, that there is a repetition where it's in the, there's a 10 places of difference. So you have 1 times, it's going to be 2 times. I'm stunned. We start to see with differences in the repetitions uh, w within the numbers that each of these factors is into, you have common currents. Uh, one can kind of be disregarded. Uh, you have five and five. So, w we does this make sense now? Does this make any more sense? I, th I think you're going a little too fast. Am I? Your questions, anyone? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Damn it. <laughs> Slow down. Kind of explain it a little more thoroughly in each step. Oh, this is a sl this is a, a example cipher text for a polyalphabetic cipher. This is just a random set of characters that we're trying to encrypt here. Right. And I'm just showing this repetition of the ciphertext within each. And I'm simply trying to show that in the ciphertext that these repetitions are demonstration of how these patterns will eventually give a good, cri a grip good cryptanalyst can look at these repetitions and discover the original plain text, or more accurately, the key by which to determine the plain text. Does right, is the repetitions being the amount Question. of times. What? Yes, that's, this is precisely determining exactly. length, the key length. So, okay, let's say five is the common occurrence that we have. So, 
we start to, we break it up into groups of five. So, O, K, I, U, V, and then V, K, uh, I, U, X, blah, 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 blah. Do you see where I got this from? Okay. And say so this is one, two, three, four, five. We have these five different columns. And if you run a frequency analysis on each different column, you'll discover that a pattern emerges. And uh, as I said before, we're in the substitution cipher. You have the single letter key. Uh, in each of these, if these are each considered a separate substitution cipher, then a key will emerge from that. And say so the key here is F, the key in this one is U, the key in this one is N, N and Y, you get the keyword. By merging all of the, by merging all of the keys from the ciphertext together, does that make sense? So in essence, you're kind of creating your own cipher key to decipher what the real cipher right. key is, mm -hmm. based on what what it, what the, the person who created the entire cipher key thought was random, when in fact is not random at all. Precisely. Does that make more sense? Question. Oh, cool. <laughs> all right. Thumbs up. What? Hail the dry erase marker. One person is following. Yeah. Okay. Now, on to the Enigma machine. We have the polyalphabetic cipher where we have, um, I if you recall, where that disk rotates and for each new letter, another alphabet is used. Well, if you have a system where the way the Enigma cipher works is, and here the, each of these are different rotors, and they are, each of these are different rotors, and they are different alphabets, and as you push a key, it, it rotates one and it completely changes the alphabet. And if anybody's ever studied like one times, or two times, two times, two times, two, the more you multiply it, the more uh, permutations, uh, there, there are more permutations by which you can understand, or by which you can obfuscate the message. And that's, the Enigma machine is essentially a heavily obfuscated polyalphabetic cipher. And how long did it take to crack that Enigma code? Fucking forever. Okay. Most of the war. Okay, switch through. Right. Uh, here's a couple examples of rotors. There are alphabets on them. And with every key that is pressed, um, it rotates again, and it just creates an incredible permutation. Uh, a good example I used in a paper out on DES is if you, um, what was that? Uh, a good example of the difference between permutation and combination is say you have you know the basic lotto, the pick three, right? You have, let's see, you, you can pick from three different letters, or three different numbers. And in the pick three lotto, if you, uh, a combination is where you can match all three of the numbers and it doesn't matter the order. And the order makes a big difference because in the pick three lotto, if you get all three of the numbers and it, it, it just three, you, you win the little prize. But if you get all three of the numbers in the right order, you win the bigger prize because it's much harder to do that because you can get three, five, two, or two, three, five, et cetera, and those would all match in the combination. However, with permuta permutation, the order matters, which makes it infinitely more difficult to understand. And, of or course, it. with language, that obviously matters. You have to get the letters in the right order or else sure. it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, maybe we should go into a little about exactly how the Enigma machine worked because I think okay. maybe a lot of people... The way the Enigma machine worked is, every, like you said, every time a key was pressed, uh, the, the wheel rotated, which created a whole new alphabet that was being used as a key. Um, and the way that anybody else would decrypt the message that was being sent, because you figure, well, if every time you hit a key, the, alpha, the cipher key is changed. How does anyone decrypt it? Because you can't send anyone a single cipher key. You'd have to send a cipher key for every single letter that is being pushed down. The way it worked is everybody had an Enigma machine, uh, and all the Enigma machines worked exactly the same. Uh, and, you know, when you press that key, it wasn't a random. It wouldn't spin this wheel until it stopped, and then a new cipher key would come out for that letter. It adjusted itself a very precise number of spaces. Uh, and so... In fact, you know, obviously, it's not random at all. And as long as you, if you can get your hands on enough messages being sent, um, eventually uh, you're going to find the repetition going on in the code, and you're going to figure out exactly. You're going to figure out the cipher key that even the Germans didn't have because they just used this box. Theoretically, that works beautifully. However, the German Enigma cipher was so fucking complex they couldn't do it. So Alan Turner had to come up with some new ideas. Um, Right. Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, even with having the cipher and they were able to understand how it works, knowing how a cipher works and knowing how to crack it are two completely different things. Um, Turin did several different, uh, Turin, there, there were several really interesting tricks that he used. For example, uh, the Germans would send out a weather report every day, and if you knew the uh, German word for what the weather was, say it's um, sunny and it's like, or whatever the German word for sunny is, you could take that word and put it into the ciphertext somewhere and hope that patterns, and, and hope that by studying the differences between these letters that you'd eventually be able to, to uh, create links between the letters. And what? Mm -hmm. Right, if you can find the pattern of it, you can determine, because you have the rotors already, so you can help start to determine the order of the rotors and where it was in the beginning. Because they sent out, um, each day they changed the order of the rotors and they changed the starting place of each rotor, and that made it even more complex. Okay. And there are a lot of ways that Turin worked on cracking this, and I, I wrote a lot more about it in here. It's it's you could write volumes on the statistics and mathematics that they used. And the Turin actually created an electronic device called the Turin bomb, which was also a predecessor to the Colossus, one of the first computers. And to give an idea of how incredibly complex these calculations to crack this cipher were, um, I mean, just look at the computer. That you cannot humanly do this. You have to use some kind of an electronic mechanical to Right, and it, and it just goes to right. show that no matter how much, how random the Germans tried to make their cipher, uh, nothing is truly random, and we cracked it. Okay. And I was also fortunate enough to visit the London Science Museum, and here's some cool pictures I got. This is the difference engine number two, which... Um, uh, it, it, one of Babbage's creations, as I went on in my lecture last year, uh, Babbage never really finished anything, and he had plans for this cool tabulation device called the difference engine number two, and I have some cool pictures of it. Yeah. That's sexy. Yeah. Weir's turned on. I know I am. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at that. And, uh, this is just a cool example of... Uh, just uh, different computers which emerged trying to uh, crack on um, this cryptography. Yeah, these are computers. These are yeah. these are these are like the world's right. first computers. This is like a step above the abacus. Mm -hmm. But I mean, by definition, they're computers. This is where computers started. So, does this make sense? How uh, human patterns relate to cryptography? Have I managed to clarify that enough? Any questions so far? question. What? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, you're going to get him started. <laughs> See, I, I have to cover AI, too. Okay. <laughs> I get to write on the board. Okay, so, so okay, so you have the plain text happy, and you have the key joy. Okay. Well, uh, what's confusing me is that you just don't have a key. That you're just, uh, I guess, looking at the machine and figuring out. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was really difficult. To and, and that's the thing. When, when you're analyzing it and you can decipher the key, um, once you have the key, that's what cryptanalysts always look for. And yeah, the whole point of this is that we do not have the key. Right. We're trying to obtain it, and that's what we're talking about. So, hmm? right. The message contains the key accidentally. It's not that the message, that the key is sent along with the message. Well, it, right, it... Right. Yeah. Any mm -hmm. key you use to encrypt the message is, by well, its it, nature, it, it, part it's of the encompassed message. with the nature of the ciphertext. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the key is encompassed by the nature of the ciphertext, you are able to, um, ex like, by studying the patterns that you see in it, you can extrapolate the key and therefore reapply it back to the ciphertext, and the original plain text emerges theoretically. And it, it's really fucking complex. 
Um, if you're interested, I highly recommend the code book by Simon Singh. Um, yeah. Yes. Which, oh, it, it, it's a good book, although I disagree with his conclusion of quantum cryptography. But, yeah. Cool. Okay. I think everyone. Yeah. Everyone's got their own idea. But I talked to Shardy in, uh, at, at H2K4 about that, and Shardy agreed. He's, he basically said, because he's really into crypto, and Shardy said that Singh is a researcher, not a crypto cryptologist. All right. Okay. And here's another cool gem from the London Science Museum. It is an Apple One. I think there are like 700 of these in the world. And the German Enigma cipher you saw before, when I was at Bletchley Park, it was really cool because it was like... Um, one of the seven existing left in the world, and I just happened to be there on the week that they were displaying it. It's awesome. It was, if it wasn't two dimensional, I'd give it a hug. Yeah. And oh, also the London Science Museum. If you want to feel old, they have a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, and a Game Boy. And <laughs> they do behind a fucking glass case. <laughs> you go in there and you go, oh man, I still have one of these. <laughs> All right. Now, it's a wooden case. Here we come to a crux, and I really like Turin. He's done a lot of cool things. Uh, as I said before, he did a lot of work at Bletchley Park, helped to crack the Enigma cipher. In addition, he is considered one of the founding fathers of modern artificial intelligence. Uh, his paper, Computing Machinery Intelligence, he introduces the notion of the Turin test, uh, which I went over this in my talk last year. Um, it's you have okay, you have computer, you have computer. And a person. <laughs> Can you read that? <laughs> no. Well, fuck you. <laughs> uh, and you have a, l l let's call it um, uh, some sort of a, a typewriter or something, or like a, an instant message window that it comes. And the idea behind the Turing test is that you have the computer sends messages and the person sends messages, and you look at these messages and you, send, you ask them questions, and it goes back and forth. And by your interactions with both of them, um, it, hi, Johnny X. By your interaction with both of them, you can, if the computer fools you into thinking that the computer is the person and not the person, then the computer has passed the Turing test. That's essentially the basis for that. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah, Turing did a lot of really cool work with this. He did uh, John von Neumann, who developed uh, ideas of automata. <laughs> what? Question? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Okay. Actually, kind of a request. Make sure when you get on IRC as Johnny Xmas, you make sure that people know that you're not Johnny X. I clarify that every day. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> pleasure to meet you too. Finally. Hang on. Cool. <laughs> Johnny X. Johnny Xmas. Johnny X. A little bit Johnny smaller. Xmas. Remember this. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody got it. Are we clear? Johnny X. Johnny X. Okay. Now we start to get into. We, we've, let, let's assume that we finish the section on cryptography and how patterns emerge in that, and everyone understands it, of course. Now we're going to break into AI, and believe it or not, this stuff is actually more complex. So you have. Uh, I ju no, I just moved to this one. Okay. I am. Right. Uh, it. The MIT AI Lab, among other things, was founded in 1958 by Marvin Minsky and, uh, uh, what's his name, John McCarthy, who was developer of Lisp, which Lisp is used as one of the languages, um, one, one of the founding languages as far as uh, AI programming and development is concerned. Well, Weizenbaum developed ELISA, and if you actually, he actually wrote a book about this, I want to say it's 76, called Human Power and Computer. Computer power and human reasoning, something like that. I um, think it was human reasoning and computer power. Something like that. Whatever. And he goes on the idea. He basically incorporates uh, the notion of a Turing test into reality. He created the ELISA project. And I went over this a little bit in my other presentation, although I didn't really understand it very well. Um, in human language, as we said before, patterns emerge in letters. However, they also emerge in the structure of the speech and the structure of grammatical sentences. And this, however, can be applied to German, French, Latin, and other languages. It's not based on the alphabet. It's based on the structure of how language works. Uh, Say, so in a typical st <laughs> in typical sentence, you have a subject, you know, a, a verb, and a direct object. This is 
English 101. You know, Timmy, t Timmy threw the ball. You have Timmy threw the ball. And yeah, did the you write that in Latin? No. What? <laughs> I can write it in Latin if you want me to. Uh, it, we'd probably read it better. <laughs> okay. <All right>. <laughs> can. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. You have Timmy. You get the idea. Right. <laughs> and when the and you have other things. You have adjectives, um, adverbs, and whatnot. Different. Uh, pieces in the language that help you to understand this. And you have interclausal uh, ideas, like if you consider this just to be a clause, like Timmy, who was drinking, threw the ball at the dog, you have this who was drinking, and who would be considered, um, what's the term, a pronoun describing Timmy. And the question is, it's obvious, it's implicit with uh, normal people as, you know, he, um, the direct object, or the uh, pronoun obviously refers back to Timmy. Timmy, who threw the ball? Like Timmy, who was drinking? If you have Timmy, like who was drinking through the ball, you have a clause right here, and it's very obvious to us that the who refers back to the Timmy. However, it is not obvious for a computer at all. And this is where we start to establish neural networks and uh, establishing patterns between them. And if this does everybody get what he's what he's trying to get across here? Does this make sense? It's very simple, but it, it, he's saying right. if you tell a computer Timmy threw the ball, mm -hmm. and then a second later you ask the computer who threw the ball, as far as logic goes, the computer's going to go, I don't know. Right. And actually, an interesting. What, it's going to go, what is who? Right. An interesting comment by Marvin Minsky actually, uh, co like in some interview with him, commented on his research. He found that the things that we take for granted, which are very easy, like walking. Um, the physics behind that and trying to create a robot which can walk is some of the most difficult things. Whereas trying to do something extremely complex, we can imitate it uh, with a computer or automaton very easily. Yeah, we still can't make a robot that walks right. Uh. They all walk like this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you take a look at, like, uh, say, Pixar and how animation has developed over the last 20, 20 years or so, to see just the vast improvements they've taken and just how challenging it is to get something that we take for granted because it's so easy. That's a great example. Right. Like all the cartoons coming out of movies these days, mm -hmm. how fluid the motion is and how realistic it looks. Army and of it's Darkness. Still, Come on. Yeah. And you know what? It's still not absolutely perfect. You can still pick out, well, that's CG. Um, you know, some, uh, with yeah, like Army <laughs> of Darkness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's and that's that's exactly what this is. People trying to tell a computer this is how things walk, right? And the immense amount of work that has to go into it, they only have a limited budget of how long they can spend writing up programs, so things still walk a little quirky, right? So what Eliza is, Eliza is the computer psychologist program. You could type messages to it, and it would respond to you, and. It would essentially have to break down the structure of the language to understand what you were saying and then create a response to uh, return. Uh, and to, based on what you told it, it would have to create its own response that matched it enough to the point where a person could understand it. And in his book, one of the things that Weizenbaum commented on was that um, like when using his program, like uh, his secretary in his office, I think it was something like that, was using the program and she actually asked him to leave the room so she could talk to the computer. And it's just a matter of, one of the cases I was going to make here is a test of AI is not necessarily what, I, I got in an argument with virtual about this, is not necessarily um, creating a system that can think, or but uh, creating a system which imitates human patterns enough to the point where we give it the credibility of being able to think. And that's exemplified by Weizenbaum's example. Um, it, it just giving credence to a computer, giving this uh, autonomous uh, superiority to the computer, saying the computer can do anything. And that really often happens, especially when the levels of complexity exceed that which, you know. That which the average person can understand. Right. Right. Okay, does this make sense so far? Question? With what? With what? Oh, Deep Blue, yeah, Gary Kasparov, perfect example. Mm hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And that actually runs into chess, is a really interesting uh, game theory developed by von Neumann at the same time as Turin. Uh, it, it's developed upon game theory, basically, which gets into branch conditioning, which is where 
Um, a lot of stuff in computer programming languages come from. Uh, but uh, chess, it's like, okay. You got him started again. Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you, One of the things that uh, von Neumann did in addition to uh, cryptography is he uh, did a lot of work, a lot of the first work, investigating the computational basis of self-replication. Sure, his automaton. And uh, he, this, is, this is not very widely known, but it's very, very interesting. Some people uh, in the theoretical biology community actually consider von Neumann to almost be the successor of Charles Darwin because he started, he started thinking about evolution as a machine learning algorithm. But one of the things that he did that was really interesting is he, many, many years before Watson and Crick understood like DNA and then R mRNA and then ribosomes and then Right, proteins, and, so, and cytoplasmic yeah, he, um, structures. He correctly predicted that the flow of information in a living organism would go from genotype through something called a ribotype, which is basically mm -hmm. a cipher, to phenotype, exactly. which is the and that's uh, where the, the whole expression. epigenesis comes through. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, on your comments about AI, um, this is actually one of the things I work with. Is we're trying to basically instead of do uh, you know rule-based AI or that sort of thing to mm -hmm. approach it from that point of view. I thought that'd be an okay. interesting comment because you're talking about von Neumann and right. And I actually uh, commented on his uh, automata uh, idea in my speech last year. Um, yeah, he, he did some really cool stuff. If you want to learn more about it, uh, there's Artificial Life by Stephen Levy. You can actually read some of von Neumann's lectures. Right. Excellent. Some, right. It's nice to meet someone in the field. That's that's great. Cool. Um, and this gets into the notion of uh, game theory ideas, where you have an instance where a decision can take place. You have the decision to make, you have the different players involved, you also have um, options. You have options and players, and within, uh, this will happen and there will be an outcome to the instance, and which e with each new instance, um, the game may change. And, and this is actually uh, part of the Nash equilibrium, if you've seen A Beautiful Mind, this is uh, Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, it's a matter of um, augmented recursive networks versus, uh, d or augmented transition networks versus recursive transition networks. As far as having a set, um, if you have set players and set options at the beginning of a game, and you run through multiple series of it with, um, depending solely on the decision and not, uh, and keeping a static player and options, um, that is completely different than if you have players and options which change with each iteration. Uh, a game of chess is a good example of this because with it, you, you, if you make a move in chess, you can consider that an instance. And with each new instance, you have a whole new spectrum of um, possibilities. of possibilities, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. that's what makes that's one of the things that makes artificial intelligence so unbelievably hard to do because mm. you, most of the time, the whole purpose behind artificial artificial intelligence is to interact with humans, and you can not predict what a human is going to do you can attempt to and sometimes you're going to be right but you know it, it's mm -hmm. even you know i mean we've all played games we all played you know first person shooters or something now be, may not be gamers but you've played one once or twice and you know you know you've got all these computer players coming at you and they're making an immense amount of decisions every time you do anything and every time you don't do anything uh, and every decision has an outcome and you know they programmers can't program to a game um you know, a perfect artificial intelligence, but they absolutely try. And like he was talking about with Deep Blue, uh, the chess machine does not actually uh, play the game of chess the way we play it, although they program it to seem like it does. What it does is it takes the current position of all objects on the board, what side it's on, finds all possible moves it can make, then determines what the best move it can make and tries to calculate all the moves it can possibly make. It tries to predict what moves you're going to make as a human and figure out what the best move to make at that time is going to be, which is why Deep Blue is such an um, unbelievably massive machine. Um, and and that was made how long ago? That was made in the 80s, right? Right. Well, I mean, it's, it was made in the 80s and different, um, like... And there's been different like iterations They've been since. changed. I think it was in like 97. Uh, he was defeated. I don't remember the exact year. But yeah, he defeat he, like Deep Blue defeated Kasparov, and uh, it caused international champion. uproar. Right. Yeah. 
Um, if you're more interested, or if you're interested in this stuff, or really, oh, like one of the definitive resources is Goodell Escherbach by Douglas R. Hofstetter. That book is fucking incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Metamagical Themas was, um, I enjoyed that. Like, I, I've only read a couple of the pieces in it. Um, I, I really like The Mind's Eye. The Mind's Eye was like all these imaginative stories compiled together. There's also uh, Roger Penrose, The Emperor's New Mind. There is um, John Searle's stuff, which Virgil is going to kill me for even mentioning his name. But Searle is, that gets into some other AI theory. And let's move on to Shirley. Yeah, I think we should stick with the matter at yeah. hand. And this is a uh, Shirley. This was developed by um, uh, Terry Winograd, also working at MIT uh, along uh, uh, around the same time. I'd say he's a contemporary of Weizenbaum. Uh, what this was is it, it, you had a program and you type messages to it, and regarding what to do, you have these blocks. You have a green block, a red block, a blue block, etc., and your triangles and whatnot. And you tell the system what to do with these blocks. You say, um, move the green block uh, over to over from th move the green block from the red block to the blue block, and it would have to identify the color with the object, and then know where to move it. And that sounds that that sounds fairly complex at first, until you start to realize. Or, or th that sounds complex, but you have no idea how hard it is when you begin to realize that the computer has to say, well, what if there isn't a blue box that you can move it to? Right. It, the, the or it, in the first place, it has to go, what, what is a block? Right. Right. A and uh, the computer has to be able to say, if there is a block to move it to, then we can do that and say, okay. However, if there isn't, you can say, well, what do I move it to? Because there, there isn't a block, it has to respond with something that the human who is typing messages will understand. And uh, li likewise, uh, if there isn't a green block whatsoever, it, uh, the same story. And one of the big challenges is people are going to say, move the green block over the red block, now move it down there. And this gets back into the sentence structure I was going on about, about pronouns versus um, subjects, uh, essentially neural network linking, is you have to identify that it and relate it back to the green block or the block that you were going to move it to. Or figure out what there is, where right. is there, what are you pointing at? Sure. Like, like Minsky said, the things that we take for granted are so impossibly complex to create in these systems. Okay, and I, I mentioned Searle before. Uh, John Searle is a championer of, um, he basically, he hates Hofstadter. He uh, is a weak AI theorist. Um, his Chinese room experiment is like a, a good paper to read if you're interested in understanding what shitty AI is. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but his Chinese room experiment, in my mind, just kind of falls through, and it doesn't really work in there. Actually, um, many students have written several responses to it. Um, somebody wrote Mind Machines and Searle. I don't remember the guy's name as a response to it. Um, but, yeah, I, I just kind of like that picture of him holding his head in shame. <laughs> okay. And that's Bartsy. And I think that's <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. It's parts. It's funny. Right. And I, I, I guess that's pretty much the end of what I have to present initially. Any questions so far? Like, I, what time is it? I could go on and ten yeah, minutes. Yeah, we totally could. I have ten minutes. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, is, is there anything that anyone would like to know more about? Pick a, pick a topic. Um, artificial intelligence I find really interesting just because I was talking to Virgil about this at, at dinner last night is um, the notion of what a definition is changes over a period of time. It, it, it just it, The same way that humans are dynamic, for example, you have to get a new passport, a new driver's license every so often because your face changes. Um, likewise, a human mind is like dynamic and it's always changing, it's perpetual. And well, it, it's not perpetual because it will eventually end theoretically. Well, not uh, theoretically, absolutely. We will die. That depends on what dogma you subscribe to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, right. when, it, when I die and come back, I don't uh, get another driver's license as Jonathan Alistair Christmas. Uh, hold on. Uh, he had a question. Yeah. What, what is it about? What Simon, ah, oh, Simon Singh's conclusion about quantum cryptography, um, which uh, quantum cryptography 
I'm not even began to get into the details on that because it's like another lecture in itself. It's another <laughs> six-hour lecture. <laughs> yeah, and that's assuming that you you know you're all up to date on quantum physics. Yeah. Um, what he said was that um, because quantum uh, cryptography relies on things like the intrinsic laws of like the nature of physics, he said that when something is encrypted via quantum cryptography, uh, it has uh, quantum cryptography is essentially the end all of cryptography. And he said that cryptanalysts just simply have nothing left to offer because it is so complex and it, it's beyond human endearing to try to decipher anything that's been uh, solved by that. And I like to bring up that, yeah, they said the same thing about the uh, Vigineer cipher. Absolutely right. Right. They've said that about every single the cipher The Vigineer cipher was out. in place for like 300 years before Charles Babbage cracked it. Yes? Sure. A you, and can't, the you can't, within our current understanding of the way things work, right. now if you go 500 years down the right. road, God knows what we're going to understand and be able to do. But right. currently as it stands, you're right. And I want to bring up, I think Virus mentioned this in a lecture at Interzone or something, uh, where he said, uh, the, the uh, example that I've heard is that you can have the most incredibly complex electromagnetic door, and you simply cannot pick it, but then you realize that it runs on electricity. So you go and you, you take a, a, a knife to the power cord and suddenly you just kick the damn thing open because it doesn't have that connecting force anymore. Yeah, I mean, and I, just uh, because the you have... The idea behind that is that quantum cryptography, while it may be incredibly complex, there will inevitably emerge some very simple solution to it. Uh, some very simple way to bypass it. Which is essentially Ex the Exactly. Right. You, you take a gun, you find the guy who wrote it, and you right. go, you give me the key. Question? Uh, quantum cryptology is... Um, let's see. Do you want to try this one? <laughs> In a nutshell. It, it's a matter of uh, determining... Um, I encrypting messages based on polarities of um, it's, uh, it's the way of creating an right. encryption key based on the go the current goings on of the right. subatomic realm. Right. Um. I, well, let's go with um. Like uh, the what? What? <laughs> Well, that gets into quantum physics and yeah. weird quantum computing shit. Um, if you're interested in quantum computing, there's uh, David Deutsch is considered the founder of that. Um, yeah, you're looking at, at electrons from a Newtonian physics point of view. Right. Um, and I think as science as a whole needs to move away from the whole Newtonian, Newtonian physics point of view if we're ever going to progress any. And that's what quantum mechanics is. It's going, all right, Newtonian physics is great for the macro physics world, but when you go get past the point of the size of an atom, uh, certain things don't apply anymore. And just right. because our equipment can't measure where an electron is and what its velocity is uh, doesn't mean that it can't be measured, just can't be measured right. by what, we've, what we have currently. Sure, to some extent. And that's where relativity theory versus, like, string theory comes in. And, uh, right. Mm -hmm. I tried. Right. Mm. Yeah, it's a very good point. He's saying that the whole point behind quantum cryptography is that you're dealing with the very fact that there is uncertainty uh, and that you're do going based on probability, not by actual fact. You don't have hard set numbers to deal with. And the fact that you're going on probability, not X, or I'm sorry, not 5, uh, makes it that much harder. Because not only do you have to determine what the key is, you have to determine of what the probability of the key you've deciphered is actually working is. And it just makes it harder. Um, and it will be cracked. 
they probably not in our lifetimes, probably not in our kids' lifetimes, maybe 300 years from now like it was with, uh, what's his name? <laughs> oh, Babbage? With Babbage. Right. Um, with Babbage, with Turin, with any major cryptanalyst, essentially. Yeah. Ex every every right. method of cryptology has been cracked. And you know, any you kind so of DMCA uh, circumvention yeah. is, is essentially the same concept. It'll continue to be like that through our uh, the entire markers. lifetime of human existence. Yes. Question? All right. That's okay. There is one instance. Oh, oh uh, a perfect cipher as far as um, and this gets back to the one-time pad cipher. Uh, the idea of the one-time pad cipher is that oh, well, you're trying to take these patterns and eradicate them, eradicate all the frequency. You can't do anything with it, and which is where a whole nature of pseudo random and pseudo random numbers in cryptography comes from, is that if you have uh, if you have some text and you have the key. The key in itself is going to have uh, frequency to it, and by a one-time pad cipher is uh, say you have um, just a, a bucket full of numbers and you pick one out and you pick another one out and you pick another one out and trying to strive to create a randomness within the key. And by using that randomness in the key, you can apply it to the plain text to create a theoretically secure cipher. Yeah. However, however um, another great book um, is Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson. He goes into this quite a bit. Um, as far as just um, the feasibility of how one-time pad ciphers work and how the human patterns and uh, just human ability in general uh, betrays it. Yeah, it limits right. human, by introducing a right. human into the situation. It totally mm -hmm. limits. I mean, if nothing else, if somebody is trying to develop random numbers, and eventually they're just going to get to a point where they're too damn tired, so they keep putting twos over and over again because they look cool or something like that. Yeah, or there's always. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should wrap this up. We have yeah. someone who's got to speak after us, and we can right. go on for you know another six hours. If you guys want to talk, go ahead and talk to talk to aesthetics really <laughs> after oh, yeah. the talk. Okay, any other questions? Oh, yeah, I, I guess that's about it. Yeah. Like, okay. hope it made sense. <laughs>